Hello everyone, it's Livia here, a case to reminded, and I'm going to make another IGCSE video. This is for the text H is for Hawk by Helen MacDonald. Um, just to give a bit of background on the author, she's an experienced and enthusiastic falconer. Um, her father died unexpectedly, and in order to cope with her grief, she bought one of the most difficult and aggressive birds of prey to train, the goshawk. Um, she wrote a memoir, um, and I think this was later turned into a novel, and she won the Samuel Johnson Prize and the Costa Book of the Year Award um, for her novel. And one reviewer mentioned how she's able to summon the mental world of a bird of prey and acquired her bird's laser-like visual acuity, which means ability. Um, so I'm just going to go through paragraph by paragraph and just offer some ideas on this text. Uh, and I just hope it helps, really. It would help if I could actually see the text. Okay. We'll check the ring numbers against the article 10s, he explained, pulling a sheaf of yellow paper from his rucksack and unfolding two of the official forms that accompany captive bred rare birds throughout their lives. Don't want you going home with the wrong bird. Um, in article 10s, it says here, are certificates required for rare or endangered species sold in the UK? So our beginning paragraph is already letting us know that this is an official purchase. It's a legal exchange and that she's following the proper protocols um, for purchasing this bird. And it kind of crops up the eye, the theme of um, endangerment. So obviously, if these are like rare um, rare species of birds and they're um, captive, they're captive bred, so they're born in captivity. Um, it's kind of throwing up this theme of endangerment. We noted the numbers. We stared down at the boxes, at their parcel tape handles, their doors of thin plywood and hinges of carefully tied string. Then he knelt on the concrete, untied a hinge on the smaller box and squinted into its dark, in into its dark interior. A sudden thump of feathered shoulders and the box shook, off, shook as if someone had punched it, hard from within. She's got her hood off, he said, and frowned. That light leather hood was to keep the hawk from fearful sights, like us. So, um, there's some lovely personification in this paragraph of, like, the feather shoulders, um, and the onomatopoeia of thump is sort of um, conveying the fact that this goth hawk has incredible strength, um, it's already given us an insight into the bird's personality. They're brave, they're bold, and the removal of the hood which sort of shows this power shift in the structure. So from the first paragraph, it seems like the people are in control. They're making this purchase um, and they're exchanging information about like making sure they've got the right bird. Um, but now instantly in the second paragraph, there's been a power shift and it even talks about the idea that the whole point of keeping um, a, a leather hood on a bird of birds of prey is to keep them calm. Um, but obviously she's managed to get her hood off and it's the short snappy sentence of like us. So the tables have already turned and this goshawk is the one that's in control. Okay, paragraph three. Another hinge on tide concentration, infinite caution, daylight irrigating the box, scratching talons, another thump, and another thump. The air turned syrupy, slow, flecked with dust, the last few seconds before a battle, and with the last bow pulled free, he reached inside, and amidst a whirring, chaotic clatter of wings and feet and talons and high-pitched twittering and it's all happening at once the man pulls an enormous enormous hawk out of the box and in a strange coincidence of the of world and deed a great flood of sunlight drenches us and everything is brilliant and fury the hawk's wings barred and beaten the sharp fingers of her dark tipped primaries poor pentine two enormous eyes Oh no, sorry, um, of her dark-tipped primaries cut in the air, her feathers raised like the scattered quills of a fretful porpentine. Two enormous eyes, my heart jumps sideways. She is a conjuring trick, a reptile, a fallen angel, a griffin from the pages of an illuminated beastery. 
something bright and distant like gold falling through water, a broken mar marionette of wings, legs and light splash feathers. She is wearing Jessie's and the man holds them for one awful long moment. She is hanging head downward, wings open, like a turkey in a butcher shop. Only her head is turned right way up and she is seeing more than she has ever seen before in her whole short life. Her world was an aviary no larger than a living room. Then it was a box, but now it is this and she can see everything. The point source glitter on the waves, a divine cor cormorant a hundred yards out, pigment pigment flakes under wax on the lines of parked cars, far hills and the heather on them and miles and miles of sky where the sun spreads on dust and water and Ill illegible things moving in it that are white scraps of goals. Everything startling and new stamped on her entirely astonished brain. So the structure of that paragraph is incredibly long, as you can tell, but there's it's sort of interlaced with these um, pauses with the commas and the shorter sentences. Um, but it's kind of like so much information is being thrown at you that the structure itself kind of represents what the hawk, goss hawk is experiencing. She's um, suddenly her world has opened up and the kind of compacted um, paragraph of all the information. It's almost like information overload and it kind of represents the structure itself represents what the goss hawk is going through. So for the sort of notes I have like short sentences reflect the precision of actions and caution so the humans have to be very precise and careful with how they're undoing this box to make sure that the hawk doesn't just you know escape um and it talks about the kind of um it also kind of shows like birds of prey if you've ever seen them in action are incredible they're very they're very accurate, they're deadly, they're very accurate when they're hunting and they do everything with precision because they have to. I mean, if you see a bird of prey like dive bomb something, they have to calculate it to perfection. Otherwise, they could end up injuring themselves. So it's interesting how the humans have kind of, they have to almost take on those mannerisms of a goshawk. They have to be very careful and precise. Um, the repetition of thump once again, which really drives home the fact that Bird is agitated and she's fierce. Um, there's a lot of metaphorical language in this section. Um, there's lots of similes that are used as well um, to really drive home this idea that there's a lot of mystical imagery and it's primal. And there's um, there's like the beautiful way she called like describes it as like a fallen angel and talks about an illuminated beastery, which is a beautifully illustrated medieval book about mythical um, and other animals. So it's almost like giving a myth-like status to this goshawk. She's in awe, the writer is in awe of this goshawk. Um, fearful porpentine is an archaic uh, word for, a, a, it's a phrase borrowed from Shakespeare's Hamlet. It's a defensive porcupine. So there's a lot of sense of archaicness to this text. And um, there's a long, prestigious history of falconry and it used to be something that the gentry or the noblemen um, back in the day would have done they would have ridden on their horses and they would have had um, a bird of prey on their arm as they go riding and they would send the hawks out to do hunting so it was um, like a sport for gentlemen and the noblemen um, so it's kind of like this archaic these archaic associations you have with falconry are very much coming through the text um, and there's like tons of metaphors you could pick out of this and tons of similes she uses, which are beautiful, but um, I won't go through all of them. Uh, it's powerful visually because it's sort of showing the overwhelming nature of what the gospel is experiencing alongside the writer also experiencing seeing this uh, gospel out in the open for the first time. Um, and I've mentioned the structures, massive long sentences to short, and it represents also the frenzied action and the speed of the goshawk's mental and visual uh, capacities. So all of this is coming to the goshawk all at once. And I mean, that's a lot to process um, as a human. It's like the sheer amount of visual cues that this hawk is receiving. It would just be completely overwhelming for a human. And I think the structure really does that justice to represent that. Um, and the primaries are large feathers at the ends of the goshawk's wings. Okay, so on to paragraph four. Through all this, the man was perfectly calm. 
He gathered up the hawk in one practice movement, folding her wings, anchoring her broad feathered back against his chest, gripping her scaled yellow legs in one hand. Let's get that hood back on, he said tautly. There was concern in his face. It was born of care. The hawk had been hatched in an incubator, had broken from a frail bluish eggshell into a humid perspex box. And for the first few days of her life, this man had fed her with scraps of meat and held in a pair held held in a pair of tweezers, waiting patiently for the lumpen, fluffy chick to notice the food and eat. Her new neck wobbling with the effort of keeping her head in the air. All at once, I loved this. Sorry, just trying to find where it's gone. Uh. All at once, I loved this man and fiercely. I grabbed the hood from the box and turned to the hawk. Her beak was open, her hackles raised, which are the um, small feathers at the back of the neck. Her wild eyes were the colour of sun on white paper, and they stared because the whole world had fallen into them at once. One, two, three. I tucked the hood over her head. There was a brief intimation of a thin, angular skull under her feathers, of an alien brain fizzing and fusing with terror. Then I drew the braces closed. We checked the ring numbers against the form. So the actions very much didn't... Oh, and then the other bit I'll read. It was the wrong bird. This was the younger one, the smaller one. This was not my hawk. So the actions denote a lot of respect. And it's kind of... Um, the short sentences are in there again with the one, two, three, with the pauses to really show the caution they have to treat this bird with and the respect. Um, but they've just checked the ring numbers so like the little tags you get on captive birds and they realise this isn't the hawk she's purchased um, and then it goes into um, that second part it was the wrong bird are all, is um, a short paragraph of just three sentences and then it goes into oh and that sort of like that sort of shows the um the shock that, oh no, this isn't my bird, which one do I have? So, we put her back and opened the other box, which was meant to hold the larger, older bird, and dear God, it did. Everything about this second hawk was different. She came out like a Victorian melodrama, a sort of mad woman in the attack. She was smokier and darker and much, much bigger, and instead of twittering, she walked great awful gouts of sound she wailed great awful gouts of sound like a thing in pain and the sound was unbearable this is my hawk i was telling myself and it was all i could do to breathe she too was bareheaded and i grabbed the hood from the box as before but as i brought it up to her face i looked into her eyes and saw something blank and crazy in her stare some madness from a distant country I didn't recognise her. This isn't my hawk. The hood was on. The ring numbers checked. The bird back in the box. The yellow form folded. The money exchanged. And all I could think was, but this isn't th this isn't my hawk. Slow panic. I knew what I had to say, and it was a monstrous breach of etiquette. This is really awkward, I began. But I really like the first one. Do you think there's any chance I could take that one instead? I tailed off. His eyebrows were raised. I stared, I started again, saying stupider things. I'm sure the other fol falconer would like the larger bird. She's more beautiful than the first one, isn't she? I know this is out of order, but I... Could I... Would it be all right, do you think? And on and on, a desperate, crazy barrage of incoherent appeals. So, there's definitely... I don't know with my notes. Oh no, hang on a sec. Oh, on this bit. So yeah, there was definitely a sense of throughout this text, I haven't finished it yet, um, but throughout this text there's definitely shows the strength of character and the majestic presence of the hawk, almost like the younger hawk is like a miracle. Uh, there was humour anticipation for what Oh, sorry, I've realised what I've done. I was looking at some of the notes I had for Chinese Cinderella. I was looking at the wrong page. So, the part where she was um, sort of shocked about the hawk, there's kind of a humour and anticipation for what her bird would be like. And the realisation was the single sentence. Um, 
the bit about the young hawk once again had the grand similes and the personification and she's daunted by the prospect of training this other bird and that's shown through these rhetorical questions um it shows a lack of control and like compared to the hawks that have kind of been presenting themselves in a very strong way um she's kind of fumbling for the right things to say and she's panicked and she's in fear because she doesn't want to train this bird she preferred the younger one the other one um and then for the last paragraph we have I'm sure nothing I said persuaded him more than the look on my face as I said it. A tall, white-faced woman with wind-wrecked hair and exhausted eyes was pleading with him on a quayside, hands held out as if she were a seaside production of Medea. Looking at me, he must have sensed that my stuttered request wasn't a simple one, that there was something behind it that was very important. There was a moment of total silence. Um, and Medea is a Greek revenge tragedy about a woman with magical powers. So once again, we have this connection to mythic imagery and the woman herself almost adopts the description of the goshawk. So like with the younger goshawk, she also focused on the eyes where she describes like they're like the sun. And in a way, the woman kind of takes on the kind of almost not mannerisms, but kind of embodies the spirit of the goshawk, like with her wind wrecked hair. Um, almost like feathers would be ruffled in a wind and it's explicitly weaker than and she's explicitly weaker than either of the hawks so no matter what goss hawk she ends up with although judging by that it seems to imply that she's going to be she's persuaded the man to give her the younger hawk um it kind of really drives home the fact that the goss hawks in this piece are stronger than the people um stronger than the seller and stronger than the buyer um, despite the fact that they're the ones who have been bred in captivity. Um, and it's just kind of, it's interesting to show that from the beginning, when they seem to be the ones in the control very quickly, it descends into a bit of chaos and it shows that the Goshawks are the ones that are really in control. But yeah, um, I hope this helps. Any questions, please feel free to um, leave them below. Thank you. Bye.